Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Here's some cranberries. Let's find uh, out if they're fresh or from the can. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doop. Bloop, doop, 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 doop. Uh, But also, canned cranberry sauce is still is my favorite. <laughs> it actually is my favorite, too. But I, I don't like it chunky. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name's Michael. I'm Molly. I'm Ramin. And today we're going to chat about Cranberry's debut album, Everybody Else is Doing It, So Why Can't We? The Cranberries were an Irish pop rock band consisting of Dolores O'Riordan, who was a vocals, guitar, and their lead songwriter, essentially. Noel Hogan, who was a guitarist and songwriter, the other main songwriter of the band. His younger brother, Mike Hogan, who played bass, and their childhood friend, Fergal Lawler, who played drums. So I wanted to start by asking both of you, what was your history with this album or any of the songs from it? Ramin, why don't we start with you? When did you first hear any of these songs? When did you first hear this album? I probably first heard the singles from this album that were on the radio at the time when I was a very small child, but I hadn't listened to the whole album or really anything off the album beyond that until preparing for this video. Definitely a, a nostalgic part of my childhood when I hear dreams or linger, but that's about it. If you have watched our videos before, you may have heard me talk about the songs that I first heard my brother singing to himself around the house. My brother is uh, several years older than me. Linger is one of them. I remember him being like, you got me wrapped around your finger. Uh, uh. And I actually didn't know what the word linger meant. I remember distinctly like being like, what is linger? Like, <laughs> like that's like, a, you know, a $10 word when you're six or whatever. I had this album. I listened to it along with the other Cranberries album, No Need to Argue. Like they definitely were in heavy rotation on my CD, cassette, radio, boombox. Boom box, that yeah. Yeah, had in like their better. Yeah. <laughs> it's similar with me. I have an older brother who is roughly the same distance in age that Molly's older brother is to her. And a lot of the music that I loved from around this time was because my older brother loved it. My brother got me into this album and he would mostly just like play it for me when we would hang out. And then his giant CD collection was on the wall in the basement and I could just pick and choose whatever I wanted to listen to. He had a six CD changer. Whoa. I only had the tiny boom box. That was our parents like in the living room had a six CD changer. But like, oh my God. I remember when the number of CDs in your CD changer determined your status. <laughs> like, like yeah. oh, mine is only three. Oh, mine is six. Like Molly, I listened to this album a ton. Basically, once my brother moved out to go to college, I bought all of the albums of his that I really wanted. Oh, that's nice. And so this was one of the first ones that I got. I still have this album in a closet in the other room. Don't know why. I don't have anything that can play it. Once I got a car, having the disc man that plugged into the tape deck. Oh yeah. And having that little that, that little wallet. Right there. That little wallet of like 20 CDs. Oh, I had one of the big ones. I did I never had one of the big ones. It got I got stolen. I had a smaller wallet that Cranberries was really commonly in there. This this album mostly, but the next couple I also liked pretty well. Okay, so now I wanted to go into some history of the band. The three guys in the band started the band in their teens. They were childhood friends. Uh, well, the brothers and the one childhood friend. And they got instruments around the time they turned 16 and almost immediately started a band. They As had, you do. <laughs> they had the band with a previous singer who was also in another band who left the band to focus on the other band and it left on good terms but then they wanted to find a female singer specifically so Dolores was their first singer a woman no, first singer was a man after the first singer left then the three of them tried to make a go of it just doing instrumental pop rock for a while and they're like no we need a singer so they auditioned and Dolores showed up on her bicycle and they met they gave her a tape of some of the things that they'd been working on she left Less than a week later, she shows back up and just jams with them and sings. And they're like, oh, no, she's it. Yeah. <laughs> they were saying things like such a tiny person with this like powerful, powerful is not the first word that would come to mind when talking about you hear a zombie. Right. <laughs> but she wasn't doing that when she was when she was 18. Yeah. They were all like 18 when this yeah. band started. Not to interrupt, but I think the word powerful doesn't always necessarily have to mean loud. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's what I was going to go into next. Yeah. They're like intense. Right. Yeah. yeah. She, she she is a very intense singer. And I think also the power came in her lyrics, which she wrote, which sound very much like an 18 year old writing lyrics. Mm. But to 18 year old listeners, that's yeah. exactly what you want. They made a demo tape 
with a local recording company and set it out to various local record stores and sold out almost immediately. And a bidding war started for these 18 year olds. They eventually signed to Island Records and were in the studio with the producer Stephen Street, who worked with the Smiths. It tracks. Initially, this album was not doing well after it released. It took a while for it to take off. The first single was Dreams, didn't really do very well. The second single was Linger, initially didn't really do very well. But they went on a tour with the band Suede. And halfway through the tour with Suede, I don't know who made the decision, but someone realized that the Cranberries, who were the opening act, were getting way better audience reception than Suede. So they switched they them. They switched them. Oof, and, that must have hurt for and, the Suede people. So the Cranberries became the headliner. And in this process, MTV heard of them. So it was really MTV playing the music videos for Dreams and Linger and college radio stations playing Linger that made them take off. It's a very college radio kind of sound, isn't it? Let's go into that sound a little bit more. I wanted to talk about the sound of the album as a whole. What would you say, Molly, are some of the, the sounds or the ways you could describe the sound of the album as uh, a whole? I would call it dreamy. They use strings a lot and there's these sort of sort of sweeping, swooshing. They have these like intros that give way to a beat. But then when the beat comes in, I, I think it's jangly. There is a jangly, a jangle happening mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. dolores vocals i mean nobody else was doing what she was doing at that time right the closest thing that people probably had heard was sinead o'connor who was all, another irish singer right and also she was not pushing her sound as specifically yeah. as far into sounding irish yeah Rumi, what do you think what how would you describe some of the general sounds of the album to modify and sort of synergize what molly said the first word that comes to mind is a fake word and it's a portmanteau. I would call this album Jangry. <laughs> <laughs> Jangly. But it's also pretty angry. I mean, I really enjoyed listening. But what I like about it is that it can combine those two words. Those are also words that you could apply to many an early to mid 90s alt rock band. But most of those other bands, you really can't put both of those words on at once. Quite a few of those other bands were either jangly or angry, but didn't as frequently combine both effectively as, as the Cranberries do here. Um, breezy also comes to mind, which I think mm -hmm. Molly said. I would also say romantic, and I don't just mean in the sense that it's about love, but sort of in the classical musician sense of the word, actually. Like the orchestrations, as Molly said, were very sweeping. Yeah. It sort of feels like if this album were an architectural style, it might be gothic. Oh, that's a nice way of putting it. And actually, you just gave me a thought, which is like, I can almost picture like a, a Monet painting, right? Like mm -hmm. with like the sweeping brush strokes and the the pastel colors. And, and I would also add discordant mm -hmm. to my description. This album is discordant. I was going to use the word dissonant, but I feel like that has certain connotations that I'm not going for with that descriptor. It's more like a discord that happens sort of in feeling and texture and in vocal phrasing, which we'll get to more in depth later. It's great hearing both of your thoughts because a lot of mine are actually quite similar to yours. The first note that I wrote is an angry Dolores is a Dolores who sings better. I think a lot of her best singing on the album is in the angrier songs and the angrier moments of songs. In general, a Cranberry song would be nothing without her vocals. The songs themselves, just like as the bones of the songs go, are usually actually pretty bland, but there's so much in her singing and in the production, which Molly and I have talked about and will continue to talk about soon, that really elevates these songs to being more than what the building blocks of the songs make them seem like they would be. Also, the melodies that have clear Celtic inspirations, I think, are typically stronger melodies street producing the album the way he produced the drums is actually quite good there's a lot of space it's very detailed in how it's panned left and right like some sounds will come just through this ear and then like it'll be a ping ponging sound in the drums and it's just the drums often everything else is more like in a place mm. there's so much space and echoiness to the drums yeah. that I think is really exciting in a, a lot of these songs. To that point, I always thought that there was something really exciting about the drums in the Cranberries albums, both this one and No Need to Argue, which is their second album. And I didn't necessarily know 
how to put my finger on what it was, but it is, it's mixed very high and with a lot of reverb. Mm -hmm. And so it feels very intense. It pops out of the texture. I don't know if I would say that the drums are themselves are intense because that to me implies like heavy metal drumming or something like that. And he's not playing like that. He's playing like a pop rock drummer would play. But it's pulled out of yeah. the texture. That, yeah. yeah, that's that's it, yeah. So speaking of textures, that's actually my next note. I think that the textures are occasionally really interesting. We've got I Still Do in Dreams, which have this like wash of texture throughout. But then we get to Sunday, which starts with this lilting, pretty soft intro that goes into the jangliest moment and the most Smithsy song. Yeah, yeah. Like you can hear Morrissey singing oh, yeah. that song. You're spinning me around. <laughs> They're totally right. <laughs> it could be a Smith song. But then after that, we go to Pretty, which is so crisp in comparison. And with all those little like snaps that yeah. come in the song. And then we get to Waltzing Back, which is one of the angrier songs. And also one of the more interesting melodies because of how Celtic it is. We've got the medium high angry side of the verses, but then the choruses which don't have vocals it's suddenly just like big drums mm -hmm. and echoey vocals and when she's doing them, nah i love the changes in texture that happened there this is now the second or third time someone in the video has said something and then realized oh that's actually a little bit more than what i intend right with like intense or when i said discordant or dissonant and i think your point about these sort of little changes like the the vocal hiccup you mentioned or like the way the track goes in and out I feel like that is the genius of this album as a whole, is that they're generating that sense of intensity throughout through phrasing and, you know, differentiation. That's sort of why I meant gothism as an art mm -hmm. movement. Like it's created through contrast rather than through magnitude. Next, I wanted to go into the lyrics. I said earlier in this video that the lyrics are pretty obviously the lyrics of a teenager. This album was written when Dolores was between like 17 and 18 years old. And it sounds like it. That's not a bad thing. Sometimes it works better than other times, though. There are a couple tracks that I think that the lyrics are like, especially when it doesn't have as good of a melody to back them up. I feel like the lyrics are like, oh, this one is not working as well. But for the most part, I don't mind, or I think it actually serves the songs that they are simple mm -hmm. teenager -y lyrics. Especially on Linger, I think. Yeah. You know, when I was l listening to this today to get ready, I was like, oh, the lyrics on this album are like pretty mid. And like, I think that's okay mm -hmm. because everything else just makes up for it. I tend to be somebody who focuses a lot on the lyrics and I think it's notable that I never noticed that about it before because I think the lyrics are not the first thing about this music. Yeah, typically the lyrics are secondary and one of the many things that can contribute mm -hmm. to a song. So I don't think that they are ever like the most important thing for the most part to me when I listen to music, but I only really noticed that the lyrics are, as you said, mid. <laughs> Um, I think that's the first time I've ever used that word, like just <laughs> casually like that. I hope I got away with it. I think that I only realized the lyrics are what they are when I was preparing for this yeah, and reading too, them yeah. and listening along. It's like, oh, huh, uh, not bad. <laughs> like, huh. So let's talk about Linger. I just want to say to my high school straight boy crush, I apologize to you for the number of times that I listened to this song thinking angstily of you. <laughs> I love this song. And you know what? I'm gonna push back on some of what y'all said. Because yes, this album's lyrics were written by an 18 year old. And yes, I was close to 18 when I was listening to Linger like in this context. And yes, the lyrics aren't Shakespeare. But I think more people like mid lyrics than we would realize. It's true that lyrics like these uh, and Molly, maybe you can clarify what you meant, because lyrics like these can be mid because they're too basic or literal. Is that sort yeah. of what you... Yeah, no, and I think what I will clarify is that I think the lyrics, they're not particularly poetic or, or elaborate or anything like that, but I think if they were, the song wouldn't work as well. Yeah. yeah. Like Michael said, in some of the songs that are not as strong melodically and harmonically, you notice the midness of the lyrics more, but with this one... Actually, the lyrics should be simple for a yes. song like this. You've got me wrapped around your finger. Do you have to let it linger? Is is actually an 
excellent lyric, yeah. right? If she said anything more flowery than that, it would be like ugh, pretentious, right? You know, right. right? Talking about when lyrics should be more poetic and when they should not be, it really depends on the genre of music that you're working in. If a singer songwriter wrote the lyrics to linger in a song, it'd be terrible. If Joni <laughs> Mitchell was singing linger, you'd be like, "What's going on? What? What is this?" <laughs> but also, like. A lot of times the lyrics that sound like they could have been written by an 18 year old, and I do not mean that as derogatory, are what it should be. Yeah. Like look at Taylor Swift's entire career. Oh now. yeah. When she tries to do something more lyrically interesting, it sounds out of place. When people are like, Madonna's not a good singer. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I don't okay. come to Madonna <laughs> to listen to good singing. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that's not what she's for. Mm -hmm. Britney Spears is not a good singer. Right. That is not the point of Britney Spears to be a good singer. <laughs> yeah. Dolores O'Riordan is not a great lyricist. Especially not as an 18 year old. I but think she got better. I don't know. I think one of the songs with some of the worst lyrics ever is Zombie. Actually. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay so she was she's 20. Like 19. Yeah. <laughs> the lyrics to linger are exactly what the lyrics to linger should be. It's not Bob Dylan. Right. Right. And if right. it was Bob Dylan, we'd be like, what's going on? Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't know where to look because there's so much going on in the texture of the song, melodically, harmonically, instrumentally, that you'd be like, and I'm trying to focus on lyrics too. I agree with that. And I think that part of what I like about the song is that the lyrics are so direct and juvenile almost. Yes. Because Naive, almost. I think that sometimes when lyrics are too symbolic and too opaque, I think that listeners can have sort of an overstimulation like what you're kind of talking about. Just to use another artist we've talked about recently, Tori Amos's music is probably equally as complex in texture as this, if not more. And the lyrics are definitely more complex than this. And most people at the time that some of those Tori albums came out were like, wow, I hate this. I think that her listeners like 18 year old me when I heard this and probably many other people when they listened to this. That's part of what makes it so cathartic. The lyrics are like, OK, yes. You have me wrapped around your finger. Do you have to let it linger? Um, yes. So why were you holding her hand? Is that the way we stand? Yes, it sounds like something out of, you know, a, a bad musical or something. But listen to the sweeping string that yes. is played. Like, it's fucking uh, strings. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like poetry. But this is how I fucking feel when I say <laughs> this. Listen to the actual music. This is how I feel. I don't think the textures would shine the way that they probably did for most listeners if the lyrics were more opaque. Okay, let's move on to Dreams. Dreams for a long time was one of my favorite Cranberries tracks. I think in time it hasn't held up as well as a song like Linger, but I do still love it. I love the dreaminess mm -hmm. of it. I love the way that it just sort of comes in all at once, right? Padam, right? You have yeah. that big pump, pump in the drums, right? Yeah, yeah, like it's... It just sort of knocks you over the face. And it, it it's a song about falling in love. And I think it really captures that head in the clouds. I'm walking on air. I can't concentrate. My heart is going thump, thump like the drums do. Talking about listening to it as an 18 year old or, or you know, even a 16 year old, or even in my case, probably like a 12 year old, it is speaking exactly to you <laughs> right where you are where you're feeling you're feeling so intensely i still really love dreams did y'all ever see the tourism commercial for ireland that played this song no <laughs> it, i saw it all oh, the that's time so well. corny <laughs> yeah, it's very corny one of the things that i really like about this is how dolores's voice works on it she sings the verses so breathy oh, mm -hmm. my love. yeah it's higher I, pitch than yeah, a lot of the other but songs. then the pre-chorus i know i felt it's a little yeah, bit more it starts to get that bite and, and then she, when but when she starts doing the yodel da, yeah. da, it's like full voice that she always played with her color even as an 18 year old the other note that i have on dreams is the male vocal that comes in the end mm. that's her boyfriend at the time Interesting. I thought that was her. I think, Molly, you wanted to talk about Sunday. You know, I don't know that I need to say anything more about Sunday than you already did, that it sounds like a Smith song. I just think it's a good song. I don't understand why it wasn't released as a single. Yeah. Um, I think it could totally stand alone. Back in my day of making, you know, mixtapes and stuff, it would have been a frequent flyer. I do think that the strings in the song are not great. Oh, I, the, I so disagree the, with the, you. No, <laughs> in, in the faster part, that ba, 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 no, ba, da, ba, I ba, love ba. that. I think it's silly. 
I agree with Michael on this one. <laughs> Although I do like this one. I still really like the song. But I do like that the strings appearing here sort of is like a little foreshadowing of Linger later. Mm -hmm. Because while they aren't the only tracks that use strings, they are sort of the swooshiest, sweepiest, breeziest strings. <laughs> well, and this is also one of the places that we hear something that they do a lot, which is that sort of dreamy, structureless or seemingly structureless intro that going into like, and now there's a drum beat and we're going to go into yeah. the main part of the song. It's a gimmick, but it works. So the next one that I want to talk about was Waltzing Back. I like Waltzing Back <laughs> as the first of the especially angry songs on the album. Her voice on this is so good. Molly and I were just talking about how, like we said with Whitney Houston, how sometimes when Whitney Houston is singing a very high note, it doesn't sound as high mm -hmm. because of the color of her voice, because of the dark color, it makes it sound like it's not quite as high. And also just because she was incredibly talented and never felt like she was reaching for any high mm -hmm. notes. Sort of the opposite of true of Dolores's voice, I think, in that she sings some actually quite low notes and they don't often sound super low in her voice, but she's she's got low Fs all over this album. Because of how forward her placement is, it doesn't sound, but also she's not biting. Like, she doesn't bite the sound to make, like, a nasty forward it's sound. The, the tone of her yeah, voice. Yeah, it's, it's It's bright enough. This way. Yeah. Molly and I were talking about Linger and singing along with Linger. And the second verse, I thought nothing could go wrong. All those, bah, that's all F <laughs> sharps. so low. Yeah. But one of the things that I really like about Waltzing Back is that it actually sounds low. Lie, 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 yeah. <laughs> and she's obviously like switching to get into that register. And I, I think it sounds cool how she's doing that. She really started to hear different colors in her voice that you haven't heard yet on the album. Right. She's really start to go like, okay, I can do that dreamy, breathy stuff, but I can also do this. One of the colors in this song that I think is really, when she does that fluttery thing. No, I don't want to, no, I don't want to, no, because you lie, I, you yeah. lie, I, you lie. It really is foreshadowing <laughs> what she's going to do in Zombie, which is going to yeah. be like their huge breakout hit. Yeah, I really think that her singing and phrasing is one of the stars of the album. And on tracks like Pretty, it's especially potent. The next song that I wanted to talk about is Wanted. That's why I said it was jangly, because it is yeah. definitely jangly. But she's also <laughs> doing a lot of color changes in that. With a very bright belt on how this is the way you want it. Eh? I yeah. didn't understand. <laughs> in our notes that we took on performance, I have a recurring theme of angrier song, better performance from Dolores. And I, I think that is accurate on this one. It's so interesting because I actually think that when she is doing the sort of heady, dreamy stuff, like she really shines. I don't know that it's necessarily a better, worse thing, but I think there are two things that she does really well. So maybe then just the angrier sound is more compelling to me. Yeah, <laughs> That's what I mean when I say that I think she uses so many tools so effectively in her voice. Like she's able to pivot between those dreamier songs and the angrier sounds. But to me, what puts her a cut above other singers in this genre is that she can utilize those tools I just said in different contexts to create different meaning. Mm -hmm. Like there are some tracks where breathy Dolores singing means breezy and adolescent and romantic and other tracks where breathy Dolores singing means like desperate and anxious. Yeah. I can think of other singers who can do both of those things, but not with the same sound, not using the same sound to evoke emotions that are in different directions. <laughs> the best <laughs> lyric on the album. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking about still can't. Maybe if you could see beyond your nose, your nose, your nose, who knows? <laughs> this is the best lyric on, on the album. When it's, we talk about mid-songwriting, it was like, that's the moment where you're like, yes, I that's how it. you write a friggin' song. I think the two weakest tracks on the album are I Will Always and Put Me Down. Molly disagrees on I Will Always. I Will Always is, is one of those songs where actually to the point that you were just making, Rumi, it's like she's using that breathy sound, but it's sounding much more despairing and hopeless and and I called it a crying in the shower song. <laughs> it's like the scene in the movie where somebody just like walks in, shuts the door behind them, starts the shower, and then they're just like, 
standing there while the shower is pouring on them and their face is expressionless. That's what this song evokes to me. <laughs> now I want to talk about what I think is the best song on the album, which is how, how you said you never would leave me alone. I love how desperate she sounds yeah. when she sings and that. intense. Yeah. Also, I really love how this song is on the soundtrack to the movie Empire Records. You know, I never saw that movie. It's very of a time. Yeah, and I, I feel think, like it is. And I yeah. think you would really appreciate it because you appreciate that time. I would also appreciate the fashion because I just, I think of like yeah. the cover, like poster or whatever. And yeah. And the, the, like the short pleated plaid skirt on, on, on Liv Taylor. Tyler. She goes up to the roof of the building and is like furious and embarrassed and devastated all at the same time. And she's like, like doing the like. Oh man. And while while this song is playing it's and it's great you mostly only hear the drums at the beginning of the da, 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 da. <laughs> it's like ah! <laughs> it's it's such a good scene and then dolores's voice comes in it's like oh okay we know exactly how she feels 18 year old sees 18 year old <laughs> i like where this track falls on the album because it's right after i will always which is sort of the lowest point mm -hmm. of energy in the album so it's nice to kick it back up yeah. And yeah. yes, I really liked this track. I really liked this album in general. With our powers combined, uh, this score of this album is an 87% or a B. Here's where this album fits in the context of other albums we've reviewed. The next thing I wanted to talk about, who is this album for? If someone has not listened to this album before, who would you say, like, if you like this, you would also like, or so, something well, like that? I mean, I do think the college radio thing, right? Which is, isn't really super a thing anymore as much. No. I would say if you like folk-infused rock that's not too hard, but still has an edge to it with a female lead. What if I don't know what folk-infused means? Uh, I would say Celtic music, I guess, or acoustic but this isn't necessarily acoustic but right. it because of the jangliness it feels acoustic mm -hmm. adjacent if you like music that can pivot from breezy to edgy through the use of things like orchestral instruments and acoustic guitar well not acoustic guitar but you know um amplified acoustic guitar check this out yeah, I think if you still have those teenage emotions or if you want to feel that connection to them again, this is a good way to bring some of them out. If you like the Smiths, but hate Morrissey <laughs> as a person, but like the music of yeah. Morrissey, yeah. then maybe this is a good ethical option for you. <laughs> Any final thoughts from anyone? Good album. Listen to it. I can't wait to review No Need to Argue. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like. Or if you didn't like this video, please like it anyway. It won't hurt you. If you have any other thoughts on this album, or if you want to answer any of the questions that we failed to <laughs> answer, like who is this album for, please let us know in the comments below. I'd love to read your thoughts. Two, this side is what, Ramin? <laughs> to this side is another video that YouTube thinks you might like, so please check that out. Up there in the corner is how you get to our channel. You see that we do reviews of media, especially music and video games, but we do some movies and TV too. If you're interested in that sort of stuff, please subscribe. You might also want to check out our playlists. So if you're only interested in the music stuff, or if you're only interested in the video game stuff, there's a playlist for you that has all that all ready to go. That should be about it. Maintain your groovy selves.